We would like to hope that the present series will advance two useful purposes. One is to contribute something to our historical and philosophical orientation in relation to ancient man, and the second to unfold a more or less comprehensive method for approaching highly controversial issues. We know that the Atlantean hypothesis is held to be a simple, inevitable fact by some who are unfortunately in a position where they cannot too strongly sustain their positions. It is also held to be a myth by others who have inadequate means of supporting their negative point of view. Thus actually, we are in the presence of a mystery story, a story which must be examined in the weight of such evidence as is available, recognizing with Aristotle that rational evidence is acceptable in any learned group. In other words, the workings of the reasoning faculties can as truly and completely demonstrate a fact as so-called scientific method. Nearly all so-called scientific facts has either come from reasoning process or led to it. Therefore, the facts, apart from reason, lose most of their utility. But reason, if trained, may achieve facts not demonstrable on the level of academic observation or experimentation. Thus we must try, throughout this entire series, to estimate our values, to gather such evidence as can be gathered, to interpret it with a largest of spirit, which is consistent with good sense, thoughtfulness, and thoroughness. We are not seeking to attain an easy believing, but also we are not interested in denying merely because others have denied, or doubting because doubts are fashionable. What then is our basic problem? This problem deals with the existence of a comparatively important culture group <coughs> at a time which we would generally regard as prehistoric. Perhaps better we should say that this group stands in the dim dawn light between prehistory and history. The moment we begin to consider this period we learn several important negative facts. The first is that in spite of our achievements in many branches of learning, we have not been especially successful in pushing back the boundaries of history. We divide the world now into two distinct groups or periods one historic and the other prehistorical. About prehistorical eras in general, we have a fair knowledge. We know something of the primitive man. We have the piltdown skull, the Neanderthal jaw, and things of this kind uh, which tell us 
that at a remote period the primitive ancestors of humanity lived upon this earth struggled against the natural hazards of their times fought monstrous animals and perished into limbo leaving but primary and rudimentary artifacts or remnants of their survival by geology we come to some knowledge and uh, by the further aid of ethnology and anthropology we have a picture of the remote world we also have a fair picture of the modern world from the rise of the civilizations of Egypt and those which flourish in the valley of the Euphrates down to the present time it is this strange shadowy interval between the prehistoric world and the historical world that we know that gives us the most baffling problem we are unable to trace the emergence of civilized man as we know him we are also confronted with a curious circumstance that historical research sustains namely that for the most part history is the continuing record of the collapse of systems of cultures the decay of peoples the decline of nations the disintegration of empires history is almost an unbroken record of things dying fading away falling into neglect and oblivion thus our history of races is a history of decline and fall scattered around the earth are the prehistoric records and remnants of peoples called the old people these peoples we have neither any clear way of envisioning nor can we adequately re reconstruct their mode of life for the most part the records and remains of these people are to be found in stone carving or monument to such we must add the usual accumulation of the ancient rubbish pile broken pots ancient decorations primitive implements and equally primitive ornamentations yet as we look around through these early shadowy remnants of things we see flashes of considerable cultural insight we do not know where this insight came from but we observe a strange conglomeration of things extremely primitive and flashes of high genius uh, the artists who ornamented the interior of the caves of Spain with and France with their prehistoric drawings were not strictly speaking amateurs today modern art is seeking to capture the vitality expressed in these ancient prehistoric paintings the masters of old architecture who have left the ruins of temples shrines cities and monumental statues and memorials in various parts of the world were not strictly savages they possessed an unusual ingenuity they also revealed considerable mathematical astronomical scientific skill who were they where did they come from and where did they go one would think that persons specializing in these fields would be so intrigued 
by this riddle that they would be impelled to examine it, to give it greater consideration. This might well have been the case had it not been that the scientific world rapidly developed a mass hypothesis, a grand strategy, and was content to permit supposedly or obviously irreconcilable factors uh, to remain comparatively unconsidered. It was much easier to ignore certain evidence than to change the grand concept which would not include it in a satisfactory manner. I think the problem in Mexico is indicative of the general train of thought. Down in the civilizations that extend from central Mexico practically to Peru, uh, there are several schools of archaeology that have been hard at work for many years. Uh, these schools can be roughly divided into three groups of thinkers. We will call them the American, the German, and the Mexican. Uh, these three schools represent three degrees of caution. And wherever we come in contact with these groups, we have more or less the same experience. Not far from the city of Mexico are the famous pyramids of the sun and moon at San Monteo Tehuacan. These pyramids, which most of you have seen at least reproduced in pictures, are monumental structures, obviously planned, well executed by a highly intelligent group of artisans and architects. So we can assume that we meet three of these archaeologists standing at the foot of the Pyramid of the Sun. We turn to the American archaeologist and we say, when were these pyramids built? And if he is a forthright man, he will say, probably, we really do not know. But you must certainly have some opinion on the matter. Oh, yes, we have that. Where facts are few, opinions are numerous. <laughs> well, when do you think they were built? Well, I would think, says the American archaeologist, that they were probably built about the 12th century A.D. Perhaps the 10th. And if we want to get very, very optimistic and run into danger of strong criticism from headquarters, we can suspect perhaps as early as the 7th or 8th century. But certainly, they are post-Christian in their monumental construction. But why do you say that? Well, we say it because it was not until the rise of the Tarascan peoples and other groups in the great plateau of Mexico until they had reached a certain culture level they could not have produced these monuments they have to be recent so you then turn to the Mexican archaeologist 